an example of how uh, bureaucracy is used to, to deny these people human rights. Uh, uh, you may have heard of a young Iranian woman, uh, Moizgan Shamsalipour, and I do apologise if I've mispronounced her name, um, a, a Year 12 student um, uh, who was attending um, school in Brisbane uh, uh, was suddenly um, uh, taken into custody and, and incarcerated in the Darwin Detention Centre just in the last, um, last two weeks. And listening to an interview with her lawyer a few days ago, uh, he was saying he's, he hadn't been permitted access and was not able to see um, uh, his client um, uh, because he um, didn't have a letter of authorisation from her um, uh, to, to authorise him to come and visit her but he couldn't get in to, 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 to see her to get that letter. And so, you know, it was a catch-22, and it just shows how, you know, um, uh, the bureaucracy is used to, to strip, um, you know, th those people of rights. I'd like to introduce Jack Waterford. Uh, Jack, until recently, was um, uh, the editor-in-large at the Canberra Times, having been at the newspaper since 1972, becoming uh, editor in 1995 and editor-in-chief editor in 2001. He was the Graham Perkins Australian Journalist of the Year in 1985 and in 2007 was named Member of the Order of Australia and Canberra Citizen of the Year. And Jack has spoken widely on questions of democratic rights and press freedoms and we're very uh, pleased to have Jack speak with us tonight. So please welcome Jack Waterford. <laughs> Gore Vidal once said that the four most satisfying words in the English language were, I told you so. <laughs> I think for an audience such as this here, and I'm going to piss in your pocket in a second, but for the moment I'm going to criticise you, it might be that the true thing is, we told you so. In the process of watching refugee policy turn sharply strange from about the year 2000 on and through the Tampa inquiry, the events of 2011 and the situation that we've now reached, which the Border Force Act might encapsulate but is also part of what Laura Tingled last week described as the demand from the Federal Cabinet for a national security crisis at least once a week <laughs> between now and the next election. There's been a strange disconnect between what government has been doing, what it has claimed it has a mandate from the Australian people to do and the feelings of the people of Canberra. We here are all fairly tolerant and liberal minded people. By and large, most people here don't seem to have any great problem with refugees. We're all Balmain basket weaving style of people, <laughs> uh, what not. In the ACT, something like 60% of all paid up Labor Party committed members of the Labor Party in, from the year 2000 are now no longer members of the party, mostly because they parted company with the party in 2001 over its abject failures over the Tampa affair and the small target policy that it then adopted. This is Green Central. This is a place where that minority opinion, which is said to exist in Balmain or inner Melbourne or whatever, or what some people once called the doctor's wives opinions operate as opposed to an apparently incredible and anti-refugee stream of view which say operates particularly around Penrith. If you remember when Julie Gillard became Prime Minister she lost her moral authority to be Prime Minister on the very first day when she proclaimed immediately that she was going to get tough on refugees. At that stage Kevin Rudd, you might remember, was rather more liberal minded on the thing but when he came back he too knew that you had to be tough on refugees and he began, not that there had uh, ever been much of a th thing in this, but the, the disappearing bottom theory of refugee policy. We're going to be even more cruel to refugees, we're going to be even more intolerant to refugees than the other thing. 
Now, I don't want to stand up here and say anything in favour of the Labor Party on this occasion, but I think it's almost impossible that the Labor Party could be or could be trusted by the Australian public to be more cruel to refugees than the current system. But the Labor Party's failure of leadership in this matter is not just a matter of its, if you like, unwillingness to take on or to lead public opinion or to get informed in a genuine debate or to be involved in the truth-telling or whatnot. It's about a failure to understand, explain and then carry into effect the argument that this is not about boat people. This is not about the right of refugees to drown crossing an ocean in shoddy boats. We who are sitting here tonight or standing here tonight talking about the rights of refugees and the distress that this causes all of us that Australia is such an unfriendly tone to it, is not about our willingness that people should die in it. It's about something else altogether, which is that Australia is increasingly seen to have turned its back on people who want refuge, who want safety, who need asylum, who need protection people who are fleeing from war and from persecution. Now, it's true, as the innuendo of those who are against it, that amongst the array of people all around the world who are labelled as refugees or as displaced people, there are people who are essentially what are now called economic refugees, which is to say people of the sort that we all or our ancestors all were. <laughs> but when you actually look at the composition, the ethnic composition and the background and the place of departure of the people who are coming to Australia looking for our help, for our protection, for our refuge, we find it almost overwhelmingly that they're coming from places such as Afghanistan, from Syria, from Iran and from Iraq, usually from civil strife, which was, generally speaking, made much worse by our own intervention and interference. <laughs> but there's not only a problem of leadership in all of this, there's also been a problem of followership in it. It is true that there is in Australia an increased unease about the unexpected and to a degree unwanted arrival of people, whether or not they're in need of our help or otherwise. It's acquired, I'm afraid to say, a particularly sharp edge when these people are alien, strange, not long. Over the course of Australian history, being alien has had five or six different effects. When I was a child, being alien really was being Southern European. Then it was Turks and Lebanese, although we'd actually had a strong Lebanese population in Australia, mostly Christian, from the 1920s. Then we got worried about Indo-Chinese people coming in. Now we're worried about Muslims coming in. But whatever it is, they're different from us and they might affect our society, they might take our jobs, they might actually work harder than us um, and somehow do us in. But politicians have responded to this strange feeling and worry and concern amongst the thing and are playing to it all the time. And the shameful thing is that so few of our politicians are willing to show any sort of moral leadership in it. Now, it's within this context that one has to look at things such as the Australian Border Force Act. I was just uh, doing a little bit of vague research on this and I uh, found a, uh, a very interesting speech from Mike Pizzullo, the new head of the Department of Immigration and Customs, where um, he says, For our part, we reported for duty at midnight on June 30, 2015, and we commenced our ceaseless vigil over an open and connected Australia. Our priority mission is clear. 
to protect Australia always. Now, some of you may have noticed that in the course of this that the new border force, this new element of this pattern of trying to get Australians incredibly excited about threats to their national security and whatnot, is accompanied by some incredibly camp 1920s Hugo Boss style uniforms. <laughs> Hugo Boss, some of you might recall, is not some sort of flash Yves Saint Laurent style of designer. He was in fact one of the very early members of the Nazi party <laughs> who designed the uniforms for both the stormtroopers and the SS and later on after the war was stripped of his citizenship and uh, not allowed to vote in the new East Germany. But somehow or other, through means unknown to me, he is a brand which continues still and which informs the new paramilitary customs force, which, as I say, is maintaining a ceaseless vigil over an open and connected Australia. Um, when one reads the Act, and I won't go over it again because Matthew has sort of taken it up, you'll find that there in it is something that is still consistent with a stream that has been present in immigration thinking and Australian political thinking about immigration for at least the past 40 years. It's about maximum power with maximum secrecy. It's about maximum discretion with minimum accountability. It's about maximum control with minimum controls. It's about a culture of resistance to any form of scrutiny, internal or ex external. It's about a culture of thinking that any form of legal challenge in it is somehow or other unconstitutional or unfair. And it's about a general refusal to submit the decisions, the discretions and the philosophies of those who are in charge of the system to any form of review. Now, within that framework, one might say there's another feature and whatnot. Actually, most of it is concerned about discipline. Although there's this complete uh, attempt to sort of put the wall over, the cloak over, to shroud themselves from any form of thing. In fact, when you read the Act, you find that there's paragraph after paragraph after paragraph about duty, about duty to maintain confidentiality, about duty to obey orders and various things like that. It wants a tightly disciplined force. But the, the force is not if you like, to exercise any independent discretions, it is to follow a central sort of will. And this sort of follows a consistent strand of thinking in the Department of Immigration. Anybody who, under, who has followed, say, the course of administrative law will understand that since at least 1985, the department, under whatever leadership it has had, has been resistant to any sort of idea that the, it ought to be subject to any form of administrative or judicial review. Legislation after piece of legislation initiated by Labor governments and by Liberal governments and then by Labor governments and by Liberal governments, but all advised by the department, have sought to create privative clauses and sections which basically say this decision is not able to be reviewed by a court or by a tribunal. By and large, all of those sections have been resisted by our courts, not least because there are actual constitutional provisions in the judicature sections of the Constitution which, which make the actions of officials subject to administrative and judicial review. But nonetheless, the very resistance to it is a central part of it. It was not always so. I remember in about 1983, for example, there was an Australian historian by the name of Geoffrey Blaney who insisted that inside the Immigration Department there was a secret cell which was plotting to subvert the Australian government by getting, I think they were Indo-Chinese people in, but basically to subvert Australia as we knew it. 
And it wasn't necessarily that Indo-Chinese people were a bad thing, in part primarily because of their skin colour, but it was that they were being allowed to come in at a faster rate than the Australian population could absorb. Anyway, it seemed to me very interesting that there was this secret cell in the department that was um, doing such things and uh, that uh, nobody knew anything about it. So I put in some FOI instructions and I discovered that what Geoffrey Blaney was complaining about was that there was a set of general guidelines on immigration policies which were quite FOIable and obtainable. And the revelation of this sort of thing tended somewhat to deflate that particular campaign of Blaney's. But since then I sometimes get the impression that the department has decided that they really wish that there was such a cell. They really want to be immune from any form of criticism or scrutiny. And as I say, if you follow the progress of the courts, the process of the thing right through the years, you'll find this incredible strand running all the way through it all of the time. Every now and again, it has come to scandal. Folk here, I don't have to tell you about the Cornelia Rao case or the Solon case. At that particular stage, we had an additional situation which was that the ombudsman had decided more or less that he wasn't interested in immigration cases because this was an example from his point of view of administrative review going too far. So the ombudsman had essentially stopped looking at any immigration matters. But the cases were so bad that uh, the government had to get somebody, as it turned out they chose a, uh, a former police commissioner to have a look at things. It turned out that there were doubts about what power the, this police commissioner could use to make an investigation and so curiously they vested him with the powers of the ombudsman. But we got an array of reports, calm, the Palmer Camre reports, on absolute atrocities and was what was described as a seriously deficient culture in the Department of Immigration. At that stage, the government decided they had to do something to address this because we can't have Australian <coughs> citizens interned in concentration camps. And so a new official, Andrew Metcalf who, while private, being private secretary to Phil, um, <coughs> Philip Ruddock, had virtually devised this policy, was brought in to head the department and to give it a new, humane and capable culture. Somehow or other that didn't survive, but we've been going further and further <coughs> since until eventually we get to on-water activities, the handing over of matters to police and the pulling of a complete screen over everything that's happened. The military commander of that process was instructed explicitly by the military end of the Department of Defence that he was not to use spurious defence style reasons to claim security about this. This is a person incidentally who has always been resistant to any idea that the press, the gutter press in particular, should ever be allow allowed to uh, witness military operations of any sort. And there's always campaigned for absolute censorship of a sort that has not prevailed in the first war, the second war, or any of the wars that, that our neighbours, the, or the Yanks, or the British, or anybody like that have been involved in. But he devised this idea that everything should take place under a screen, behind a screen. The reason why for this need for operational secrecy was that it might convey information to our arch enemies, the people smugglers. Well, again, I don't have to overstress a point here to you that putting a cloak over all of this activity is a way of permitting things to occur that the Australian public, even the supposed public of Penrith that can't wait to put their boot into the refugees, might not suffer or endure if it were to happen into them. It's the same culture which has made all of our refugee camps all strange, remote, far away, inaccessible, available even to visits from journalists or from politicians only if they sign 
multiple documents submitting everything they say and do to any multiple forms of censorship. I'm not suggesting that our sailors or our customs officers or other people are performing, you know, random brutalities on these people just because they can and because they will get away with it because nobody knows. Um, most of them are decent people, but they are following policies, they are following orders that most of us could not stomach to see. And via contractors, they are in places such as Manus, in places such as Nauru, um, creating a form of imprisonment and punishment that that is sim simply unconscionable when applied to people who have come to us for help, for refuge, for asylum and for protection. Now, I don't believe that ordinary, even ordinary Australians who are said to be hostile to, to the refugee things would wear this <coughs> if it weren't for the national security style of screen with which all of this has been wrapped. The idea that somehow or other amongst these people or these people themselves represent some threat. Some threat to the inviolability of our borders as if the mere proof that a fishing boat can get here is proof that we lay vulnerable to an invasion um, by the Chinese or the Japanese or the Indonesians, whatever. The threat that knowing something of the tactics of such fishing boats and the people who send them out might somehow or other convey sophisticated intelligence that will allow people in Indonesia or in Pakistan or whatever to defeat the military operators of our, of our custom services, our border protection services. That, that a system of discouraging people from taking these boats must depend on punitive measures taken through the use of third parties who are unaccountable and through a system which treats any allegation or any expression of concern as uh, being something that's raised by enemies of Australia, so-called advocates, people who don't know whose side they're on, and where any piece of whistleblowing, any piece of uh, description of what has occurred is met almost invariably, first with bland denial, then with refusal of access, by claims of secrecy, by punishment and shifting of people further away from the scene, by transferring the matter to be investigated by the very people who are alleged as often as not to have been involved. And then, if it comes out nonetheless, the doing of absolutely minimum things and claiming that the problem is now perfectly all right and that the only problem is one of, um, you know, a few bad apples in the barrel. It's perfectly consistent with the way power has always been exercised by bureaucracies, not necessarily evil men, but, but within police forces around Australia, within armies and so forth like that, that if there is no system of checks and balances, no system of accountability, power will be abused. Now, I know both Mike Pizzullo and Raymond Quadlibe, and I know them both as people who are in many respects decent, very ambitious men, but they have long form in resisting scrutiny and in being hostile to any sort of idea that they're part of the democratic framework of Australia or that they operate by the national interest. And both are themselves advocates in the sense that we ourselves are of the sort of regime that they serve also as public servants. And each of them, as leaders of teams, operates, have created, because they've been able to create this sort of thing by, by, from, from scratch and everything, a, 
a yes person um, sort of culture where people who might cavil at what is happening are discouraged and thrown out. Those of you who read the Canberra Times, for example, and see how the immigration department, the old immigration department, has been entirely cleaned out, you know, will know what I mean. Now, I talked right from the start about 30 or 40 years from now. Our children, our grandchildren, will be looking at us reproachfully and saying, why did you suffer it to occur? What, what did you do? How could it occur? Well, it may not happen entirely that way. A generation before most of us were born, Australia was behaving in much the same way and is indifferently to Jewish refugees trying to escape from Europe. There was marked hostility to any sort of form of settlement in Australia. Ultimately, reluctantly, we agreed to take some, but unluckily, very few were able to get here before events overtook them. I have to ask, why were our leaders so weak? Why were our populations so indifferent? Well... I don't know entirely the answer, but I think it determine, depends in part on the determination of people here to do something, to actually do something about it. I don't think it can depend on whistleblower legislation. We've had whistleblower legislation in effect in Australia for a few years now. So far as I can tally from it, the only, there's only two actual cases of its being uh, of, of things happening. Two Aboriginals have been... Uh, severely punished for disclosing government information and a, uh, a woman in a civil organisation was punished for divulging details of a unique form of scholarship given to Mrs. Fr Mrs. Frances Abbott, the daughter of the Prime Minister. Um, with that sort of model available to people, you cannot just rely on the integrity of the odd person who might speak out. This is a rotten system. This is a system that's not worthy of our system of law and that's not worthy of our system of morality and it's time that we did something about it. Yeah.